This video is sponsored by Game Toppers. Turn your own kitchen or dining room table into a premium portable game solution at a fraction of the cost. Hey everybody, welcome to the final installment of the What Happened To series. Now if you've been following this series along in real time, you'll know that I'm sort of cutting it one week short. Although I'm still ending up with 10 videos in the series, which was my initial goal to set out. Now, if you're just happening upon this video, you don't know what I'm talking about. This was a series where I went back to 2010, went to Board Game Geek, looked at the most anticipated games geekless for that year, 2010. And then the following week I did 2011, 2012, and so on. Now, these geek lists were compiled by a fellow named Rick Vineyard, and uh, he you know, got all the nominations and votes and everything, compiled it. And he compiled several geek lists after a while. I don't remember which year he started doing this, but he, you know, we'd have like the top 20 fantasy games that were anticipated for that year, top 20 Euro games, top 20 this and that. And, but I was looking at the top 20 overall. And so I started, like I said, in 2010 and worked my way forward. So I'll have uh, links to all this stuff, links to a bunch of geek lists and stuff that I'm gonna mention here in the video description. Uh, but I basically started 2010, I did five videos and I kind of paused and did kind of a summary video, which I'll have a link to below, kind of midway. And one of the things I did was I did not look forward uh, to the following week or the following year until I was done with that year. Just to try to keep it somewhat you know, pure in a sense. Now, of course, I've lived through those years and been involved with you know gaming and stuff for those years, so I had a sense of what they were, but you know, I didn't really ever specifically recall what was in and not in these different lists. So you'll see, if you remember from last week, it was probably, like I would say, from my perspective, my worst list, because there was a few games that I hadn't played, you know, and wasn't really aware of in a lot of ways, until I looked at the 2018 list, which was gonna be this week's. I was going to do 2018 and then 2019 and then maybe a summary video. Um, so, and it was, it was even worse. It was a lot worse. It was probably about half of the games. I was like, what the heck are these things? Now I did look ahead because I, I, it really gave me a lot of pause. I looked ahead to 2019 and then even, which was going to be my last one was 2019 because I was just going to do 10 years worth. And I kind of thought like, you know, doing 2020 and 2021, that's too recent. So there's not really been any, you know, significant amount of time to process what happened to those years. But I went ahead in this case and looked for, looked ahead to them. And those are much better than the 2018 list, at least from my perspective. And the problem with the 2018 list and the 2017 list, and less so with the 2019 list, and definitely less so with 2020, was the rash of kind of one-off Kickstarters that populated the list of anticipated games. And I've made mention of this before with the idea that it seems like, and I know this is the case, I, don't, I can't speak to specific games in which did it and which didn't do it, um, where they drum up support and send their backers to the anticipated geek list and try to drum up the votes, which there's nothing wrong with at all. I mean, that's good marketing in a way, kind of sort of faux guerrilla marketing. It's a little bit disingenuous to say it's like, you know, viral or organic for sure, because it is driven by the publisher directly. But that's not to say a certain publisher that doesn't have a Kickstarter could put out a newsletter like Fantasy Flight or GMT Games and said, hey, you know, we've got these games coming out this year. One of these is nominated for most anticipated. Go check out the geek list and vote for it. Same idea, same difference. Um, but in terms of, like I said, an organic sort of emergence of what is actually anticipated, what has kind of caught the collective, you know, froth <laughs> and fever for the upcoming year, it kind of throws it off. It kind of throws those lists off and it kind of taints those lists. You know, regardless of if it's ethical, I don't think it's unethical necessarily, you know, whether or not it's, you know, it is sinister in some ways. I don't think so, maybe a tiny bit, right? But I will say it does taint the list because you're trying to, you know, from my perspective, as I'm trying to go through this list and try to get a good sense of, okay, this was kind of the hotness. This is what collectively people kind of wanted and what they were expecting to come out of the year and then see which of those kind of lasted. It gets a little bit tainted when it's sort of like, you know, you've got one sort of behemoth that's just driving their 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 backers to go and check it out when those backers have 
sort of a financial incentive in a way or some kind of incentive to see the game do well because they've so we kind of, the Kickstarter is kind of an investment in a way you know a little bit more than just actually buying a game because those games aren't finished you know when you have a Kickstarter it's nine times out of ten is not complete you know rules aren't complete arts not finished uh, prototypes aren't finished you know uh, production uh, preview copies where the publisher gets a copy checks out the components that stuff's not finished so it's a little bit there's a little bit of an investment mindset there and so I think it really threw off instead of making a video of like me going well, I don't know this game I don't know this game this game is no longer around and what is this nonsense you know this looks terrible uh, which some of them did. Now there's some good games on, you know, even the 2018 list. Like I said, about half the games are really great. I remember Barrage is on there. Um, that's the only one that sticks out. But uh, there's a lot of other ones too that were on there um, that uh, that are still around, still popular. Some I still have in my collection. Barrage being one of those. So there's plenty of good ones too that don't suffer from this sort of symptom of kind of the Kickstarter thing. And I was discussing it with some of my media friends about this. And I was like, man, you know, this is not a big deal. <laughs> but it kind of ticks me off because I had made this um, series. And I thought it was an interesting way to kind of look at things. I've been getting great feedback from you folks um, about it and kind of reminiscing in some ways. And kind of, you know, some of the discoveries, just kind of going and looking back at it in this way was kind of interesting. You know, some things that, you know, maybe I should have expected that I didn't expect or some things that were definite surprises to lots of people and just, you know, what lasted, what didn't, that kind of thing, how the hobbies changed, you know, over the last like 10 or 12 years or so. And some of just the way the hobby's grown in certain ways and expanded and certain parts of it have shrunk down and different companies have changed. All that stuff's been really cool. But the one thing that just kind of irritated me because even though this was kind of part of the discovery was like, oh, okay, things kind of got off the track, off the rails around 2017, 2018, 2019 with the whole Kickstarter, like just hype machine in terms of just, just from the guys of this list. Now we can get into other ways that, you know, people do have problems with Kickstarter in a way. Some I think are valid and some aren't, but the process of that, still bugged me and I was I told this to some of my media friends but I was kind of debating like I don't want to like come out and make a video and be all worked up about it because it's just board games you know but it's also like the other side of that coin is like it's just board games it's like who cares <laughs> you know? like and I don't want to make a video where like nah, I don't really care anymore about this <laughs> you know this particular angle that I was going out because that's pretty boring but I thought it was a, there was an interesting takeaway, and I'm not going to go on too much longer about it. And uh, one of my buddies brought up the point of like, uh, kind of in an unrelated conversation, but it, it, it rung true here, where the way that we're first exposed to games has really changed over the last 10 years and 20 years, with the internet being the first way that people are exposed to games, and then you know Kickstarter and GameFound and all that stuff. Um, being now the way that people are a lot of times first exposed to a game. You're not like demoing the game at a convention or a game store or a buddy's house or whatever, or reading about it or like it, it, even, even in the last like 10 years, like watching a video about it maybe or reading a review and then checking it out. Now it's like the way you get at it before it's kind of gone through some of those hoops and stuff, it's traveled, it's been produced, it's been vetted it's been all this stuff now your first exposure is this glitzy one page spread on a crowdfunding uh, page and the the interesting thing about it is i went through today and was looking at different kickstarter projects and game found projects and backer it uh projects and i'm like these all look the same they have this there's a type you have the sort of the the big old graphics for the uh the, the bylines of people like reviewers like me and stuff will give you've got the videos and it's always like the same people on there doing the videos and the previews is like these people do like are on every kickstarter doing every preview and it's like the same like six to eight people doing preview videos and i'm like god this is the same and then the way the stretch goals and the add-ons and all that stuff is d displayed like there's different color schemes and there's different like motifs but the layout 
is the exact freaking same. And it's just the same like beat and re repetitive uh, program. And I'm like, ah, it's like a machine. And so I was listening to a, I'm gonna come back to the point here. I was listening to a podcast talking about artificial intelligence and there was two interesting things. And these are interesting regardless of what we're talking about. So there's two kind of metaphors on there talking about AI. And one was this paperclip analogy where you build an AI that is so uh, uh, proficient and so like elegant and just has so much ability, but without any real rules, it's just you build the most general of AI, what it'll end up doing, this is like a thought experiment, is it will take and convert every spare atom in the universe to this elegant form of a paperclip, just to pick a random object that's kind of like, you know, swirly elegant thing. So this AI gets going, kicks on, and then the whole universe is one giant cluster of paperclips because the AI doesn't really have any morals, right? Or any bounds or any sort of common sense, you know, common sense in the sense of a collective, like, hey, we expect the world to be this way. So th that's interesting. So, okay, but that's also very extreme. So if you also though, if you programmed an AI that was very efficient and you said, okay, I want to program some machine or robot to give me coffee every day. And that was its only purpose was to go and get you coffee at all costs. <laughs> so what would happen is the robot would go and get you coffee, but then on the way back to giving you the coffee, maybe it ran over your dog <laughs> or maybe it took a chunk out of the house because something has happened to kind of throw it off its routine, its, its pattern, but it's gonna give you the coffee. You can guarantee that, but you can't guarantee all these other parameters. Now, obviously you'd wanna program the thing smart enough to account for that and, or not give it all the capabilities um, to make it able to do much outside of that. And I felt like with the whole Kickstarter thing, the ease of it, the ease of creating a Kickstarter page, the you know relative ease, because it's not, completely easy because you got to come up with nice graphics. You got to come up with a good plan, a good idea for a game, probably a decent design, but the ease of putting that kind of page up and then getting interaction, getting feedback and, you know, backers to back it. It's just so dynamic and so easy to do. And it kind of feeds itself. And there's been enough successes, successes and enough really good Kickstarters. I mean, I look over here at Dead Reckoning. I happen to really enjoy that. Onk and Blood Rage and stuff up here, great Kickstarters in my opinion, um, and lots of other things like that. So you've got enough good ones rising up there that kind of pulling the rest of this junk up. And that feedback loop, I think the data of the last several years proves out that there is somewhat of a problem there because it, the number of games that come out every year are just insane. They keep going up even like through this pandemic and everything, like gaming just keeps growing and growing and growing. And the ease of getting it done is both a double-edged sword. It's a curse and a blessing because you're able to get it done and get it out there. And um, because of things like Panda game manufacturing and a lot of places like that, that work directly with um, Kickstarter producers and stuff and they're, it's it's very easy to get into because a, a couple of years ago I did like a podcast about when I interviewed uh, Panda Game Manufacturing and the whole process of that like it's pretty easy to do like the logistical part of it now if, Never mind all the shipping snafus of the last year or two um, But the whole process is pretty pretty easy to do So the nice thing about Kickstarter was there was a way to break through the traditional gatekeepers for certain types of games. So for example, a game like Gloomhaven, which is the number one game on BoardGameGeek.com. Let me say it again. The number one game of all time. You know, that's an opinion. That's not an opinion I share. It's not my favorite game. But collectively, it's the number one game of all time. And just to be clear, I think it's a good game because somebody called me out. Another video said I was bashing Gloomhaven. I'm like, well, this is not my favorite game. <laughs> um, and um, I'm kind of, I'm kind of short circuiting that conversation. But it's the number one game of all time on Board Game Geek. It would not have existed without Kickstarter. It just would not have. There's no way the designer, publisher Isaac Childers would have taken it to who would he have taken it to? 
to say, I have this giant game with 90 quests. The box is like this big. You know, it's gonna weigh 25 pounds. Um, make this and produce it and people will buy it from you for, at the time, 120 bucks. Excuse my phone. So coming to my kind of final two points of this, I just wanted to, to talk about, because I don't want to get, the one thing I didn't really want to happen was get into too much of a, kick, a discussion about Kickstarter, because I'm not like anti-Kickstarter, anti-Game Found, anti any of this stuff. Um, but I think there's a little bit of like a runaway train with some of that stuff that's, you know, uh, it's just kind of out of control in some ways. So there's, okay, let's set that aside though. So the, there's two things I wanted to bring up. One was I did actually email Rick Vineyard or geek mail Rick Vineyard uh, because he stopped doing this list. And I was curious why that was. I didn't know if it was because of the pandemic, because you couldn't really, um, you know, tell when a game was going to come out even more than before because even before pandemic you know they say a game was coming out in 2015 it wouldn't come out until 2017 you know or even later so with the pandemic and then the production kind of stopped it's probably very hard to make that list and do it in such a way that was concrete um but i noticed he didn't do 2022 there's no 2023 list which would have started right around now looking forward to the next year maybe the shipping stuff there's a reason or maybe he saw what he kind of, what I kind of see at the last couple where it's like, well, it's just a bunch of Kickstarter backers coming to pump their game. I don't want to be a part of that. I don't know what it was. So he doesn't do the lists anymore, um, but he never replied to my geek mail. So, um, but that was an interesting thing. I was like, oh, why isn't he doing the list anymore? Because they stopped. Um, so I'm very curious if he ever sees this video, if he would answer that or if somebody knows, because I couldn't find a post or anything that mentioned anything about why he stopped or anything. Um, so that, that's the one to leave that there. And the second one is I want to kind of turn it back to you folks, the viewers, and say, well, okay, so what exactly gets you hyped to put something on your anticipated list? I mean, it's got to be kind of this old standby. It's the designer. If you're a Stefan Feld fan, you see a Stefan Feld game come out, you're like, yep, let me look at that. If it's, it's an, if it's in a theme or a universe, if you're like a Dune fan and a new Dune game comes out, or a Zombicide fan, a new Zombicide game comes out, you know, what gets you hyped there? Or is it like, I mean, there's nothing wrong with this. Like, do you see something with like a lot of cool miniatures and you're like, okay, that looks like a really cool game. Fair enough. I'd really like painting miniatures. I'd like to paint those. Uh, Cause that's one thing I don't really want to get. It bugs the crap out of me when I see some other influencers or content creators or whatever like see miniatures and then just like shit on the game because of that because you know you don't know what you're talking about <laughs> because painting is joy to like tons of people millions of people and that's part of the process now if the game is not your most well-balanced carnegie brass barrage talus game doesn't matter it doesn't doesn't matter to those people it doesn't matter to me all the time um Anyway, a little tangent little little, little little kind of uh, rough edge there. But um, it, without circling back to, if you see a game with miniatures and you're like, those look rad, I want those miniatures. I don't really actually care if the game is that great because I really like painting. Is that something that, that you like? Because I want that to be an okay thing to say here because it is 100% okay to say that. Or uh, what is it? You know what I mean? Like, is it... When you look at a game, do you, do you want to see a gameplay video? You're like, ooh, that looks like some cool mechanics on the other side of the coin here. That's some new way of doing like supply and demand, you know, management and this kind of stuff. Or do you want, or do you look for something like in the terms of Kickstarter, do you want some bang for your buck? So if you could spend the two to $300, you want to get this big experience. Um, and I'll just talk real quickly here about um, a game Oath Sworn, which you will see on this channel soonish. Um, actually, at the time of recording this, we're going to play it this week again. That was one that I actually looked at, and I was like, oh, man, this looks pretty cool. But it looked like a lot of other Kickstarters. I was like, yeah, this looks like a little different, but I've been, you know, fool me once, fool me twice. And, again, the Kickstarter page of the Kickstarter experience looks the same. I was like, eh. But then, okay, then it ended, it went on, and then I saw more stuff about it, um, I don't know, several months ago. And I was like, ugh, I should have backed that. <laughs> this looks actually pretty cool. Now, serendipitously, publisher reached out and said, hey, do you want a review copy? And I never replied to an email so fast in my life. I was like, oh yeah, this looks great. 
and the game just you know spoiler for the review it's it's so far it's panned out really well it looks it's really cool um so um that's the kind of one that i was tempted by and it's one of those where it's like you get this big experience and it's i think it's reasonably priced for what you get and they have a few different modes i don't want to get too mired in specifics but you know is that something you look forward to like i think that's also okay you're like you know what i don't buy that many games a year you know whatever maybe you got tons of money no big deal but you know i want to when i go in for something i want to go into this big experience like you like a kingdom death you know or something or you want a big whole thing so when you get that you're going to play that game for months you know and and is that the kind of thing so i'm just trying to poke at some different things that what gets you like fired up when you see something and you're like you want to go after it's like mechanics a theme components you know uh, whatever anything so it, uh, i can i can think of a few things for me but it's very hard when i take a look at my collection to kind of put my finger on it and i think maybe maybe that's the case for a lot of you too where it's like there's this this confluence of components not game components but like all these different parts that go into making a game make me go oh, okay that looks cool and you know sometimes you can get fooled or it's just you know it's just a mistake you know realize it because it's all first impressions anyway um i mean even after you've played it once you can still play it again and be like actually i don't like this <laughs> you know um but it's hard to really quantify all of those little pieces and uh, and that's one of the things about games in general is they're very much a sum of their parts, right? Because mechanics is great, but if it looks like a prototype, yeah, some people may not care. Other people might be like, I don't know. I like to be kind of entertained visually and tactically. Tactically, not tactically. Tactically and tactily. And all those things. I think that is part of of life it's part of the gaming experience all of those different senses are kind of in play there so it's hard to kind of stir that pot up and try to come up with a good sort of mixture you know for w what makes the game good or makes it exciting to look at and stuff so anyway i just wanted to kind of talk about that um and just kind of realize and try to just try to think about it. and maybe there's a vlog in the future or something I'm kind of wearing my kind of writer's block on my sleeve here. Um, and because uh, it was just like I hit this point and I was like, man, this is just, this list sucks. This 2018 list really sucks. And the 2019 list was, yeah, not, it was better, not much better. 2020 was good, you know, but then of course, you know, everything went away after that. Um, and so, yeah, I just, I wanted to just kind of, it's kind of a short circuited end to this series, but you know, um, it's been interesting to kind of see this process and see all of the different ways that gaming can kind of do things, <laughs> you know, um, the, ex the experience of my last like decade or so in the hobby has been very interesting. Um, you know, I don't want to bore, because the people that watch the channel a lot, you're like, yeah, we, we know where you've been. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's just interesting to me, just all of these things. And it's it, it really is not suited too much to uh, critique in a way. Anyway, so right, that's it. I'm going to leave that. And so I'm going to stop this series now. Thank God. <laughs> and then I'll get back to reviewing some games again. I got a little stack uh, lined up here. So anyway. Uh, thanks for hanging in there, and uh, thanks for putting up with it. Uh, it was an interesting kind of little experiment, so thanks.